violence against women. Um, the NGOs in this sector have actually somewhat surprisingly say that um, Boris Johnson's strategy on violence against women is actually not that bad. Um, but obviously it could be strengthened. So would you strengthen the uh, London strategy on violence against women? Um, in terms of the Met Police, there's still grave concerns about their investigation and treatment of victims of um, sexual violence and domestic violence. What would you do in terms of dealing with those issues in terms of the police? And very importantly, on the issue of rate prices and centre funding, which Boris kind of half kept his promise after a very, very hard campaign, both some very good work for NGOs. What would you do about rate prices centre funding? And finally, uh, you and I were both on the platform when uh, no one much liked our responses on the question of female genital mutilation and what we should do to deal with that issue in London. So what would be your response now? Thank you. Thank you. And then Stephen. Hi. Um... Ken, in the 80s and the 90s, you had a fantastic reputation for the GLC and the GLA on LGBT rights. Um, in the last few years, that reputation has been a bit more muddy, I think, by announcements, say, for example, um, an Islamic preacher coming to City Hall when you're in power um, talking about executions for people beforehand, um, and recent kind of like Tory party. Could you give us a sense of, in the next term, if you're successful, what do you think the priorities will be for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in London? Good. And next question. Hi, uh, uh, Matt from Westminster. Our uh, question is a uh, straightforward one. It's about uh, transport fares. Um, do you feel that there's actually a need for a complete restructuring of the transport fares in London and in the surrounding areas, um, given the recent sort of past decade where we've seen increases going above interest rates, or oh, inflation rather, sorry? And um, what do you think of Boris's plans to try and centralise control of the rail system that's going into London? Okay, three questions there. Violence against women, LG, LGBT issues, and fairs, and, um, and uh, the rest. Uh, on the, the question of fairs, we, we, I mean, when we cut the fairs in 1981, it's by, I think, I can't remember, it was 30% or 33% now. And we actually got more, well, we got the same amount of fairs in because the fairs cut was swamped. And you find the number of new people coming on. Now that was a third. It was at the height of Thatcher's recession. So we actually had seats available on the tube during the rush hour. Now we won't get that level of income um, from this because you can't get any more people on in the rush hour. But I do think there'll be an increase in off people travel um, and uh, perhaps the weekends. And so we might actually be able to, I mean, give them a 7% fares cut, freeze them throughout 2013, and they're not going up beyond inflation. If we do get a better, income from that. I mean, we will actually preserve the, 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 the um, fares for perhaps for another year or something like that. I'd, got, I'd like to halve our fares, frankly. Um, but, I mean, I'm not inheriting the best economic circumstances. And on this, I mean, for all things get fares cut through, we can have any amount of discussion because <clears throat> Jenny will be um, a member of the TFL board. I mean, Darren, are you tearing the Transport Oversight Committee at the Centre of Council member? Who does? No, I've been doing the parliament. All right. Well, 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 I'm well, looking for a change. No, we haven't. I've done it. I've done it for eight bloody years. You know. it's, not, it's not him who decides. All Boris who decides. No, it's the assembly who decides. Yeah, if the assembly wants to do a major piece of work on what changes we need to feed in, but I mean, I mean, it's just about getting that thing through quickly. On the railways, I, I mean, it's, this is really it will really piss you off. I. The last Labour government I actually changed the law so the mayor could become the franchising authority for all suburban trains coming into London, not intercity, but suburban. And because most of those trains start outside the London boundary, they changed the law so that there'd be two people on the Sheffield board to represent the interests from people outside London. And just before I lost sight, I was negotiating with Ruth Kelly that the mayor would become the franchising authority. And that's absolutely clear. We would take each of those and routes as they came up um, and bring them, if possible, into the London Overground and up to London Overground Standard. Uh, uh, and that was the direction we we're going. Boris Johnson got elected and just didn't even carry on talking to Ruth Kelly about it. Now, I mean, with an election coming, it looks a lot tighter than he thought it was going to be. So, oh no, he's in favour of doing that now. Well, frankly, we could have had several more of the lines coming into London and being brought up to Overground Standard. And I would immediately start badgering the government again to say, I want those powers and we'll go into those areas because it's, I mean, predominantly Tory voters that live in most of them 
and actually say, you know, get in touch with your Tory MP, let the mayor do for your line what we did for the London Overground, which has just been voted on Britain's best railway. On lesbian and gay, gay rights, I mean, basically, yes, there's um, a lot more still to do, because in, in, if anything, I think there's been a bit of an upturn in homophobic violence on our streets. Um, I know you're right, there's everything is done to distort um, <coughs> the things I say, because they want to discuss anything, you know, my tax affairs, whether I think the Tory party is riddled with homosexuality, rather than discuss, you know, fairs and other issues. What I said was, isn't it wonderful that the Tory party is riddled with homosexuality? <laughs> After all those bloody years, they denounced me as a pervert for actually taking these issues up. And I just think it's something absolutely appalling about our media. And we're not just talking about the Sun here, but the, all of them. They take half a sentence. Um, and no, I mean, I'm, I'm delighted the Tory party has now got lots of openly gay people, but many of those were absolutely silent as I was getting into the net for actually promoting a support for lesbian and gay issues through the, the, the 1980s. Although a lot of them were good deal at school, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of the other ones weren't. They were in there, eh, frankly. So, no, I mean, so once again, we've been meeting with the lesbian and gay community and, and, and bisexual and transgender community, and particularly, they need to set that agenda, and then we need to take it forward. I'm really proud. There was an absolutely amazing um, first partnership ceremony that we did at City Hall about three years before the government got the courage to actually make it, you know, a national um, policy. But it was one of the most moving moments in, in my eight years as mayor. And it, it, the fact that, you know, the world didn't end, and even Richard Littlejohn didn't denounce it, gave Tony Blair the courage then to actually bring forward that legislation. Um, then on the question of violence against women. Well, that actually, there's two things here. I mean, when we set up the Women's Committee at the GLC and the Women's Unit, and raised issues which I remember we were challenged on, because at that stage, genital mutilation was lawful in Britain. There were doctors lawfully performing genital mutilation. We started the campaign to make it illegal, working with feminist groups, and I remember the Tory party saying, this is just a cultural thing, you know, the Tory members on the committee. It was also legal for a man to rape his wife. And when we started the campaign to change that law in the Women's Unit, people were saying, well, how could anyone ever be able to prove it? Um, and so right the way through my political career, I've not set that agenda, but I've listened to the women that wanted to, and we will do that and take it forward. Of course, we will preserve the rape crisis centres that are there. If it's possible, we'll find the money to extend them um, and have more of them. On the question of the Metropolitan Police, when I became mayor, I, we didn't, uh, the, the mayor now has power since January to give much clearer direction to the police. Everything I did had to be in negotiation with the commissioners. They weren't resistant to this, and we wanted them to take domestic violence more seriously, not this idea of these things happen and move on. And one of the reasons we had a very big fall in the murder rate in London, the biggest part of that fall was in men murdering the women they lived with or had lived with. And partly that was because police were forced to actually take domestic violence seriously and then continue to monitor the situation. And very often the man <coughs> that first beats his wife or girlfriend goes on subsequently to murder. And a big part of the logic behind or reason behind that fall in the murder rate um, in London was actually getting in there and preventing what would have gone on to be a murder and we'll clearly want to work with feminists and, and women's groups across London to set a new agenda for the police, because these things constantly have to be taken forward. Thank you. We'll take some three more questions. So, Shara um, first, um, then I'll take the um, chap on the front, and Ian as well. Um, Shara Ali, I'm also a Green Party London Assembly candidate. Hope to join you in City Hall, if the people will it. Um, I wanted to ask you about something which is of great concern to me, which is the encroachment of our public space, particularly for the use of public protest. And we've seen very recently both people being evicted from Parliament Square and also from outside St Paul's as part of the Occupy movement. Just down the road we've got Frinsby Square and gladly, fortunately, there are still some people there. And what I wanted to know um, is what, within your powers as the Mayor, and there's always a, an argument about where your competencies lie, but <coughs> it's very concerning to me how both primary legislation and police are interpreting this in a very draconian way, and also with council bylaws sometimes not being interpreted correctly. What powers do you have 
um, to actually ensure that people are entitled to their basic democratic freedom and rights to camp outside in the case of the City of London and also just to, for whatever reason, reasons that we may not agree with, are assisted and facilitated and not prevented from using their voice outside of the ballot box, which is extremely important to us. Thank you. And another point then. Yeah, um, like a gentleman, one, um, very interesting to speak tonight, Mr. Livingston. Um, I'd be very interested and encouraged by much of what you said. Um, what I'm particularly interested in is a point that connects both air pollution with cycling and indeed transport. And that is the plan to have a priority um, lane through central London to take uh, dignitaries, VIPs, uh, members of the media, and possibly athletes from, for example, Park Lane to various Olympic sites across London. <coughs> now, I don't want to pin too much down on a particular example, but sometimes it's used to do this. And I'm just interested, obviously, there's a food period a few years since you haven't been there in which you wouldn't have had input on a plan such as this. But is this the kind of scheme which you envisaged <coughs> when you backed London's big four Olympic Games with Sebastian Coe? Um, and indeed, is it something which, is this really an example of how London is the greenest games? Because for me as a cyclist and committed person to public transport, it seems to be a total lunacy, really. I'm interested to see what your take is on that. Good. And third question, Ian. Um, mine's on similar ground, the cycling air pollution. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious about, <coughs> with cycling, um, Will you be able to match or do better than Boris has done on the money? And actually, I mean, sadly, from his manifesto today, I mean, he seems to have given up any vision on it at all. I mean, he presents on it. Um, and the other side of it um, is that 20 miles an hour limits are the one that cycling groups see as, as the potential for a big breakthrough. Um, and, uh, I mean, we, we've had Boris suppress reports on the 20 mile an hour across bridges, London's bridges. We've had Boris, um, you know, not going there with 20 miles an hour on the super highways. <coughs> you know, I, I just want to hear more from you about the specifics of, you know, what you do on 20 mile an hour limits. Um, because I, I know that was not quite there when you were in last time. Right, okay, three questions there then. Facilitating the um, <coughs> right to protest the Olympic route network and cycling in 20 miles per hour. Well, on cycling money, I mean, in fact, I mean, the mayor's budget is <coughs> almost £9 billion pounds on transport. And I'm going to mean this in an offensive way, I don't want to take out of context by the sun. But, I mean, in fact, cycling money is a small change. There shouldn't be a problem. That's not what. It's when you come to say, you know, will there be a crossrail to and a crossrail then you get to the billions of this and that. There's not the slightest doubt in my mind we can find resources inside the TFL budget to maximise whatever it is that the Greens who will lead on this agenda in, in the administration actually come up with as, as things to do. Um, on 20 miles per hour zones, I'm completely in favour of those and committed to them. Of course, our problem is the mayor only runs the red routes. On all the others, they are under the control of the boroughs. And I think the, the Labour government, when it established the mayoralty, made a big mistake. I think broadly all the major routes that sustain bus lanes and like that should be under the control of the mayor. So we are stuck with working with councils that you know want to, are prepared to go down this route, um, and we'll use the financial you know dangle the money in front of them to, to actually do this. My preference as well is that. I would like those 20 mile per hour zones administered not by bloody road tunnels, which I think are producing, but by cameras, because you've got camera technology now that can see the number plate of a car as it enters, and the number of places it leaves, and calculate the time, and you know find them rather than have you know, accelerate, and we all know that what it does in terms of emissions with the, with the road tunnels. So make it much more modern and efficient, um, and just press ahead because we all know. I mean, if you're hit by a car at 20 miles an hour, you've got 90% chance of living. If you're hit by one at 40, you've got 90% chance of dying. I don't see any, it shouldn't take 10 seconds for anybody, except mad people like you know, Brian Coleman and Boris Johnson, who seem to be in love with speed and uh, all of that, to, to come up with anything along these lines. Um, on the VIP lanes, this was the one thing I felt unhappy about when we were bidding for the Olympics, because the Olympic Committee has been sort of stuffed so many times by cities that promised things when they were bidding and then didn't do it. So before you're allowed in the ballot, 
they make you sign the contract. I've heard about this thing. You have to sign up for that. It's the one thing where I always said to you, I see this one I'm not happy about, I'm going to come back and do this. And I think it's going to be completely <coughs> sort of alienating to people. A, the argument given for this is that the games in Atlanta, athletes miss their event. And there is no public transport in Atlanta. It was a bloody nightmare, and athletes did miss their event. And we're not in that position. Also, I mean, for a whole variety of reasons, the athletes are all sleeping on the site. You know, they've got 3,000 homes there, all going to be filled with athletes. So, I mean, mostly they can walk to their event in the Olympic Park. The truth is, these lanes are for the VIPs of the corporates like McDonald's and Coca Cola, so they can be in Park Lane hotels and whisk through central London. Now, I have, as somebody said, I mean, I haven't been in the building. I, the, the day after I lost, my security pass was cancelled. I'm only allowed in City Hall if I'm accompanied by a member of staff, usually from the Labour group. I'm not allowed to wander around on my own in case I do some damage or something. So, I know only what I read in the papers or I get tipped off by an assembly members. It may be that Boris Johnson has made some formal a legal decision that I can't unravel. But what I've already said publicly is if it's possible to do so, I will allow buses in the VIP lanes and taxis. Because I think Londoners in a bus are very important people too. And if that really pisses off the Chief Executive of Coca-Cola, I'm delighted. And one thing I will be saying, because I mean, actually the eyes here were, 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 were not difficult to work with and all of that. I think I mean, what I will say to ISC members if I'm the mayor in the game, they need to start to rethink the nature of what the games has become. I'd rather have a smaller, less expensive games and less completely obscene corporate backers, I mean, like I mean, the, the firm that took over Union Car by Dow Chemicals, I mean, which I think, I, mean, I will, I've opposed this and I'll mostly join protests about it if Dow Chemicals rap does go around the Olympic Stadium, because I think it degrades the whole concept of the Olympic movement. Mm -hmm. um, and then on big public space protests, I mean, this is a very interesting area, because although I had no real power hey, to direct the police, the Commissioner, John Stevens, knew, and Ian Blair knew, you can't survive if the Mayor's denouncing what you do. So everything, all the major things about I mean, neighbourhood patrols coming back. And, I mean, I could use the, the power of my control over the budget to take policing in the direction I want. No one was that clear on the protest. The, the year before I became mayor, in 1999, the President of China came to London. And as his motorcade went down a, through um, Green Park to at, at dinner at Buckingham Palace, Metropolitan police officers took down the placards of pro Tibet protesters. Mm -hmm. And completely illegal. And at my first meeting with Stevens after I became mayor, I said, nothing like that can never happen again. The next time the President of China came uh, to, to London, he could hear the protesters screaming abuse at him. And we had a clear rule. You, I mean, there are sometimes problems if you don't have someone necessarily in the line of sight, just in case they go a bit too far in protest. I mean, but they, there must always be the ability for the protesters to be heard and put their point. And that's the balance to be struck. The police are there to prevent violence that could endanger life. They are not there to prevent protest. And th that was made clear as we came up to every major demonstration. And I think that the record of, of, of my eight years is one in which people didn't have a trouble protesting. The moment Johnson took over, the first big demonstration was against um, Operation Car Sled, a, the a Israeli invasion of Gaza. Johnson's response was to say, anyone protesting against that is anti-Semitic. Mm. And the result, a lot of heads got cracked by truncheons outside the Israeli embassy. Mm. If the mayor is broadly dismissing yeah, everybody who's protesting as, you know, smelly, you know, scrappy people. And even if they're Jewish. And, and I had to tell you, I mean, Boris Johnson is in no position to complain about other people being smelly. So many of his senior staff. So you, you should use the showers we provided the site. <laughs> so now I'll make it absolutely clear to, to, to Bernard Hogan Howe. The job of the police is to prevent violence, yes, but to guarantee the right to protest. And I wouldn't allow the police to be used as they've been under the Johnson administration. I mean, particularly appalling wasn't just the, the use of kettling around the, the, the G20 and the death of Ian Tomlinson. In many ways, much worse was those kids who were protesting 
against the cuts who were kept till the small hours of the morning on Westminster Bridge. Mm. Almost like saying, we're mm. going to teach you protesting can be unpleasant. Mm. Remember the protest against the war made just before the invasion of Iran. Everything was clear to make way for that protest. And I mean, The other one that really annoyed me, it sounds silly, the idea that police arrested people at Fort and the Masons because yeah. of part of chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they didn't even eat the bloody chocolate. You know? <laughs> I mean, that is not the use of police time I want to see when we've still got women being raped. Thank you. Well, I've, I've no sense of smell, so you and Boris don't smell any different to me. <laughs> um, we're running, we are running out of time now, so we're coming to the end of the hour. But looking at the score sheet, I see there are um, there are three questions that I'm going to put to you, and it's going to be a simple yes no answer on, on, on each of these. A simple yes no answer on each of these. Um, Jenny has published clear um, proposals for a fair pay ratio within the yes. GLA group. That's a yes. yes. You are committed yes. to um, a, a clear yes. ratio between the highest and lowest pay. We're going to um, cut the, the mayor's salary and abolish several of the high paid posts and that money will be used to give an above pay increase to the lowest paid. I can't give an exact because I don't know how many jobs I'm going to get rid of at the top. <laughs> okay, and then second, second question. Um, you championed a um, Thames Gateway Bridge road building scheme in East London. Um, Boris is now championing a, uh, a, a tunnel under the uh, a road tunnel under the Thames. Um, Greens have said we need neither. Are we going to see road building plans resurrected if you're elected mayor? It's one area we did have a real. This is yes or no. Well, yes I or can't. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> the question won't arise because there isn't any bloody money. This is one. Boris is promising to do this, but there is no money. I mean. If there was money, we'd have a row, no doubt, about whether or not to have a bridge. But, I mean, also, I mean, this government isn't going to give the, the mayor the money to do this. If I get that sort of money, I want to extend the DLR, the Croydon tram, things like that. So that's, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, and then, then the third question, again, another really, another really simple question. Um, Jenny's published very clear plans to insulate a million homes if she's elected as mayor, something Green Assembly members have done. Looking at um, your proposal so far, you're talking about 400,000 homes. Is that enough and can you make a commitment to make it higher tonight? Well, I want to do the maximum we can. And More than 400,000? If, if we, I mean, I can't, you don't want... You'll be the first to complain if I promised more than 400,000 and we only did 400,000. I tell you what I've just done. Last summer I had my own home insulated, the full thing there, the four and a half inches internal um, insulation on the exterior walls is stunning. And you realise the heat just leaches out. Now, that costs a lot of money. And but what I want to do is a deal with firms like EDF to say, I want you to pay to do that, particularly starting with the elderly and the poorest, and you recover the money by the saving that's made in the energy cost. And when you've got your money back, then saving goes to that, that person. So that, because very few people are going to be able to afford to do it up front. It was thousands and thousands of pounds to do. And you then got to decorate and all that. So it's big money. But I think that the, you know, the energy companies are just above politicians and journalists in, in terms of public contempt. And we may be able to browbeat them into doing it. Well, thank you very much, um, Ken. Thanks for thanks for taking the trouble to uh, to come along. To thanks to everyone um, for their for their questions. I think it's been a very interesting um, job interview. And, uh, <laughs> we will we will be in touch and let you know how. You do. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming along. <laughs> oh no, with no, an absolute Twitter, Twitter lockdown. Thanks, Ken. Um, we're going to have a